we're looking for companies that A, are profitable, but then there's other factors that we look for. And it, typically we're looking for things that are sort of growth in nature, right? We want to see small companies grow into big companies. That's where, you know, historically, or at least my experience, I found the biggest value is in finding these mispriced growth opportunities at a small scale that the institutional investor cannot participate in, even if they recognize it. We spoke on the Millennial Investing Podcast back in my first ever episode with TIP, and I've learned a heck of a lot about small caps since that interview. So today, I wanted to get into the weeds a little bit more about your strategy with small caps, from the buying process, to monitoring your businesses, to figuring out what to sell. So to kick it off, you like getting your small caps business at a discount. After all, you publish a biannual report for your subscribers called Cheapies with a Chance. So let's start here and discuss the evaluations you look for in potential investments. Sure. Um, okay, well, first off, we start by by flipping over as many rocks as we can, the old Peter Lynch adage. Um, and what that means is we go through CEDAR filings up here in Canada. Um, and, you know, there's, there's 2,700, roughly 2,700 public companies. So there's a lot of companies to go through. And we have a certain criteria we look for. And predominantly, these, the, the criteria really fits best for sort of call it the small caps or, or even nano caps. So we're looking for companies that A, are profitable, right? Which um, will distinguish themselves significantly from a lot of the other you know, small companies that are out there. But then there's other factors that we look for. And, and typically, we're looking for things that are, are sort of growth in nature, right? We want to see small companies grow into big companies. That's where, you know, historically, or, or at least my experience, I found the biggest value is in finding these mispriced growth opportunities at a small scale that the institutional investor or, you know, sort of the, the call it the bigger investor cannot participate in, even if they recognize it. Right. So we're, we're trying to find those characteristics that, um, I'd almost describe it, you know, that a fund manager will buy, but can't because it's too small. And that's, that's growth, that's profitability. Um, that's, you know, there's some other factors or capital structure and things like that, but the, the, the big driver is growth and profitability. If you can, if you can just find those type of companies, you've really, well, A, you've gotten rid of about 85 other or 85% of the rest of the market, but you're, you're finding those companies that have that potential to really turn into major, major winners. Yeah. So, and, and I know that you like, um, obviously, like you just mentioned, because the institutions can't enter into the fray here, um, you obviously get these massive mispricings. So because you are dealing with smaller ones, do you have any specific um, uh, parameters that you use in terms, let's just say in terms of PE or say, you know, enterprise value to earnings that you won't go above? Like, are you are you always looking to try to stick below a certain number? Or how do you view that? Well, not really. Like, um, look, a faster growing company deserves a higher multiple. So what we're really looking for is less, less uh, sort of a, a defined number in terms of price uh, to earnings. We're looking for what we call a, a peg ratio. So a lot of people would know what that is, a price earnings over growth ratio. So the faster growing company deserves a higher multiple, right? So I've, I've done very well buying, you know, stocks that are trading at 30, 40 times earnings. If those companies are growing at hundred percent or more, then you can justify that. Um, and then there's companies that you, you could buy at eight times earnings that are declining in revenue. And I wouldn't touch those because that, that's a melting ice cube as far as I'm concerned. So you, you, you're, you have to be a little bit more flexible. And, and quite frankly, the good ones, you know, the hyper growing companies tend to get a higher valuation anyway, if, if people are properly paying attention. So, so yeah, I, I, I use a peg ratio, which I can talk to if you want that, that, that's really the driver in terms of what we think something's cheap or not. Yeah. Would you mind just going over a quick case study using the peg ratio for the listeners to better understand it? Sure. Sure. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a real world example of a company that, that, uh, you know, we, you know, we found call it mid last year in thermal energy. I think you might even know it. So, um, here's a company that was growing at about 70, 80% a year. And, um, when you look at its earnings, you could model up pretty quickly to see it was trading at about 10 to 12 times earnings. So, you know, some might think 10 to 12 times earnings, not super cheap, but when you, when you uh, sort of layer in the fact that it was growing that fast, you've got a peg ratio that um, is sub one, 
like significantly sub one. Anything uh, below one is typically viewed as uh, inexpensive and anything above one is considered expensive. So, so what you do with the peg ratio, and there's two ver uh, variations of it. You take the rate of revenue growth. Well, okay, the, the actual, the, the real version is you take the rate of earnings growth on a per share basis. So if a, if a company's earnings is growing, it's let's say 100% a year, it's doubling its earnings every year, and the stock is trading at 20 times earnings, you have a, a 0.2 peg ratio, right? Um, and that would be considered cheap. Now, what we do is we actually take a little bit even more conservative approach. We take a, uh, the revenue rate of growth and, um, and then use that as the factor. So if we do that, what tends to happen is your earnings growth rate is usually leveraged, so it grows even faster than that. So if we can find something that's growing its revenues at 60% a year um, and you know trading at 20 times earnings, then we know we've got an extra buffer because likely that earnings is growing at 100, 150% a year, right? So that's what we look for. And, and because, you know, because we, are, we go through all the companies out there, we can sort of rank all the different companies against each other. And what we're trying to do, and this is what we do with the cheap piece of the chance, is we're trying to find, you know, the best or the cheapest based on a peg ratio. Um, and then we add in the fact that if we can find something that's sub $50 million market cap, we know that it's even likely more mispriced or more, or, or call it less discovered. So that's, that's what we do. And, and, and you know, you just described the cheapies with the chance. <laughs> so I know that you, uh, you just, you just talked about how you like to go and look at every single business in Canada each year. And so I know, um, in mid 2023, you said that the exact number was, I think about 14% of the businesses in Canada were profitable. Um, now I know you've done, I think you're working on one right now, so I'm not sure how far along you've come, but, uh, can you share what number of Canadian businesses right now are profitable? Is it the same thing or is it higher or lower? Yeah. So it's, it's roughly the same. Um, it's, it's been an interesting market over the last several years. What, you know, typically what happens is when the market gets, you know, healthy and frothy, you get a whole bunch of new companies that come in, right? Companies that are, you know, a little bit more speculative, they're looking for capital, they're, you know, they're, they're newer businesses and they, they're not as likely to be profitable. So you, you start to get that number ballooning and the percentage of profitable companies actually goes down. Now, the, the flip side too, and kind of what we're seeing right now is some of the really good profitable companies are actually getting bought out. So, so that, that's slightly driving the number down as well, but, but historically the number doesn't vary too much. So yeah, it's roughly the same as what we saw mid, mid last year around that call it 13 to 15% uh, of all the companies listed in Canada are profitable. And then we take a subset of that because we want to find profitable companies that are growing as well. Excellent. So one of the major issues that investors have with small caps is that many have very short histories from which to form conclusions. So to decrease risk, I think many investors just simply stay away from uh, micro caps specifically because of this factor. Um, from your history in small caps, what have you noted are the biggest risks to an investment going south and how do you minimize the impacts of these investments? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's, that's probably the most important question an investor has to ask themselves is really what's the downside and what's the risk? Um, so I, I can talk about how we mitigate our risk uh, when we're buying, you know, the, the small companies. First off, uh, look, if, if you're buying a profitable company, you've really, really significantly de-risked that investment opportunity, right? The, the, I'd, I'd almost go back and say almost every major mistake I've made was, uh, in, in expecting too much of a company that wasn't profitable. Right. And so if, if you're, if you're looking at, um, you know, de-risking yourself as much as possible, stick with profitable companies that, um, it also sort of, it mitigates um, the financing risk that's, that's, uh, possible as well. And the, the you know, there are kind of two different things you got to watch out for. One is risk of failure to the business. So that means, yes, of course, a, a profitable company will still have risks and you, you, you may end up with, you know, a competitor that comes in and just, you know, kills them or, or a regulatory change or something that you can't really foresee. Um, that's, that's sort of a, a standard business risk that you, it, it's very hard to, you know, prevent. The, the, the biggest thing you do to sort of mitigate that is buy with a, a big margin of safety, right? So if you're buying it cheap enough, you're kind of mitigating that, that business risk that's so hard to predict. 
But if you're buying a company that likely has to finance, you know, especially if it has to finance to keep the operations going, that's where you, you add a, a high degree of risk. And we call it dilution risk or financing risk. And we try to avoid that at almost all costs. Now, it's, um, you know, if markets are good, if capital markets are healthy, then yeah, they can keep going back and raising money. And, and you know, so as long as the, the sort of that, that opportunity is still there, they're fine, right? Or, or at least the business is fine. The problem you have with that, though, is it's diluting your ownership of the business. So um, it's not necessarily a risk uh, to, you know, that the company's going to go to zero, but it completely dilutes your ability to see a, a significant gain, right? So if, if you're constantly getting diluted, it, it almost prevents the, the upside from, from materializing, right? So I've seen a lot of, this happens a lot in the, the mining space where you see these companies, you know, they go from a, a $20 million market cap to a billion dollar market cap, but this, the price has never moved, right? It's like, if you were a shareholder, um, you've never made any money, even though the, the value of the business is growing. And that's because they've issued you know, millions and millions of shares. So for us, what we want to do, it's, it's like anything. You want to de-risk everything you, you, you participate in and still maintain upside. So for us, we, we look for profitable companies. Um, that takes away that, that risk that something could materially go wrong quickly and, and all of a sudden, you know, they, they're out of the business. Um, you know, we watch for the balance sheet. You know, obviously you have to, you know, you want to see a balance sheet that, call it healthy, um, you know, debt is a four letter word. Um, you got to watch out for debt. And, um, you know, if a company has taken on too much debt, that clearly increases the risk. Um, but so, so if we're happy with the balance sheet, then it really becomes a function of, you know, if it's, if it's profitable, what are we paying for? It? And the bigger the margin of safety, the, the more risk we've taken out of the, the equation. So. I really, really like your takes on financing because it's uh, it's not something that you hear talked about a lot. And, and I know you know a lot about it and you've researched it a lot. So you recently wrote, quote, going back to the market for funding can be very expensive. For instance, raising 1 million in shares is not the true cost of financing. When conditions are challenging as they are now, you can get bad shareholders who know they have the upper hand with a company that serially dilutes, selling and driving down the share price. There's also considerable cost involved among the leadership team who spent significant time hunting for money. Then there's commissions on financing, legal and accounting fees, sweeteners like warrants, an IR firm, and more. The result could mean getting a bad price on new share issuance requiring even more shares, an excessive number of warrants, which means even more shares. So in a perfect world, you'd probably just love to see a, a, a business that can self-fund its day-to-day -day operations as well as its growth if, if that, that's what the direction it's going in. But since that luxury is often reserved for a lot larger, more mature businesses, I'm interested in knowing what your general strategy is for assessing specifically the funding in specific businesses and, and understanding, you know, what's a good situation versus what's a poor situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one thing that we look for and we think is vital to any company that's, well, I'd say any company, period, but more importantly to small companies and especially companies that are likely going to have to go and finance is you want to see somebody um, ideally on the board of directors that has capital markets experience. Um, and, and ideally they have a vested interest in that company, meaning they've got a lot of shares in that company. And why that is, is because the, the, the capital markets or the financing part of this industry is cutthroat and it's deadly, right? If you don't know what you're doing and you're going out there raising money, you will get scalped like you wouldn't believe. So you need to have somebody on that board that understands the dynamics of the industry and knows how, you know, what a good deal looks like and what a bad deal looks like and how to go and get a good deal when you're going to raise money. So, so having that it helps out quite a bit because you, you're right. Um, the cost of going out and getting money is not just the commission that gets charged, right? Um, typically, there's a discount to the trading price. It can be upwards of 20 to 25%. Um, a lot of times I have to add sweeteners like warrants um, and, and broker options, and there's a number of other things. Um, and yes, it's costly for management to have to go out, and, especially if they, they have to do this on a regular basis. You're, you're taking away from the operations of the business. So all of these things are factors that come in. And all of a sudden, when you sort of kind of do the math from a, from a shareholder standpoint, 
um, yeah, okay, they're raising a million bucks. Yeah, maybe they paid 7% in cash commission. So theoretically, you're getting 93 cents on the dollar, but it's being done at a 20% discount to you know where your shares are. And your man- the management team's taking their eye off the ball and they may have lost the customer because they, they were spending their time getting this stuff done. You also get, um, if, 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 there's, if anybody sniffs a financing coming, you tend to see the stock price get hit, right? Um, and, and usually when, when a company is going out to raise money, they've got to go and test the waters. So the minute they test the waters, that the potential for that sort of news to leak is out there. And that's when you start to see the real pain as a shareholder that, that they're going to have to suffer because of these financing. So it's never black and white, right? There's always way more cost. And again, a reason why we try to avoid those type of situations as much as we can. So one thing I've noticed with a lot of these nano caps is, you know, when they kind of when they're in their infancy and they're, you know, not profitable at all, they are going to the markets and issuing equity to, to, uh, to raise funds for their growth. But then, you know, a lot of them, if the successful ones, the ones that you are looking at become profitable and they're able to kind of just eliminate or not, maybe not fully eliminate, but heavily decrease the amount of share issuance that they need in order to grow. So I'm interested in understanding more about the inflection points here. Like what are the capital markets or, or you know, banks looking at from these nano cap businesses that will allow them to get more comfortable with them actually giving the money rather than just, you know, taking shares in the business? So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the nice thing is, um, you know, when, when you're, when you're a public company, you're, you're, you've actually gone public likely to go and raise money, right? Equity capital. Um, what you want though, is you want as many options uh, as possible to go and raise money when you need it. And, uh, the, the problem is, you know, until you're able to prove to the bank that you can actually pay that money back, right? Um, they're not likely to give you any, any debt. So you're, you're stuck with this situation that, you know, I, I can't go talk to the bank until I'm, you know, cash flowing and making money because otherwise they're just either going to charge me an arm and a leg or they just won't give me the money. Um, so, so you need to see companies that actually have the wherewithal to, to pay back that cash. Then, then the other key thing to remember is, okay, now what is the bank actually lending against? So you know, I've been involved in situations where if it's a software company, it's very difficult to get a bank to lend money because there's no hard assets, right? You're, you're basically, uh, uh, you know, the, the collateral is a, an income or revenue stream that if it disappears, there's nothing left to go and chase, right? Whereas if it's a company that produces hard goods or needs machinery or, or things like that, there typically is a, uh, you know, an asset they can collateralize. So, you know, you, you've got, let's say you've got this piece of machinery that's generating revenue and something goes wrong you know, that revenue disappears, the bank or, or the lender can go after that asset. So it, it kind of depends on the type of company. Um, you know, if, if you're a company that has hard goods that you can use as collateral, then you're more likely to get debt even before your, your you know, cash flowing. Whereas a software company, you're unlikely to get debt until you're cash flowing, right? So, so those are the things to look for. Now, you know, you still have to have proper capital allocation. Somebody in the business has to sit there and say, okay, yes, we can get bank debt, but our share price is so high that it makes more sense to actually do equity or, or vice versa, right? So you, you, don't, you don't want to just go and get bank debt because it's there. And sometimes you don't want to just go get equity because it's there. You got you to gotta know how to work a calculator, right? You got to know how the, you know, the, the results will be if you take on that type of, uh, uh, that, that kind, kind of capital. Excellent. So you said before, quote, none of my 10 plus beggars ever started out of swans. They were all some form of ugly ducklings. Learn to love <laughs> micro caps with fixable problems, unquote. So this is a, an awesome quote, and it's some, somewhat at odds with what Warren Buffett famously said, that which is, uh, you know, turn around, seldom turn. So I'm interested in learning more about what potential problems micro caps face that you think are the easiest and most value accretive uh, problems for shareholders and, you know, mm-hmm. people in management to solve. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I never like to say I'm uh, disagreeing with Warren Buffett, I, you know, but, but actually I think so. So, um, so, you know, we don't actually buy a lot of turnarounds, right? We, we buy companies that have something wrong with them, but typically it's something wrong with the optics or maybe even the capital market side of things, right? 
So um, I'm not a huge fan of turnarounds. I'm a huge fan of companies that have hit, you know, maybe they've, they've struggled over time, but they've actually fixed that thing. And now they've hit that inflection point. Um, most of my, you know, swans um, were companies that, you know, had to really, really struggle for a period of time and then somehow found something and it clicked and things started to go. Um, like I can go back and all my major wins, um, I, I know they had some struggles, right? Um, so, so we're actually looking for things that are more optics, right? So why is this company not trading properly? Why is it not trading the valuation it should? And it's usually, you know, maybe they have extremely poor IR, right? Maybe they have a balance sheet that looks ugly because of some of the legacy issues, but their income statement is fantastic, right? Um, maybe they've had to change management and now this new management has, you know, righted the ship. Those are things that all, you know, they're all great, but they, they show up in the financials. They show up in that sort of criteria that we look for. And yeah, you might say they, they, they basically have already gone through their turnaround and now we're just able to buy you know, at a discounted price because the market hasn't figured that out yet. You know, th there's, there's a, a friend of mine's got, um, you know, Manish Sudan has got this term he uses, um, uh, it, it's information arbitrage, right? We just found that information before somebody else did and we can put it in place and put a value to it. Right? I like that. Yeah. And I know that a lot of like, just, I, I've looked at a lot of the businesses that you've looked at too. And, and, you know, a lot of times it's not necessarily even yeah, they don't seem like turnarounds. It just feels like they've, you know, maybe they've gone through some unnecessary or short-term headwinds, right? Like COVID, for instance, was a big headwind mm -hmm. for certain businesses. And, um, and you know, they, then they get, they get punished for it, which maybe it's fair. And then now that COVID's over, they're, they, they're kind of unleashed again. But the market, you know, like you said, with that, that, that point that uh, they, they don't realize things quite as fast, especially in these micro caps, they just don't see it. So you can definitely find some incredible opportunities there. Exactly. Exactly. That, that's exactly what we look for is that, you know, companies that were sort of wrongly put in the penalty box, we, you know, we try to identify when they're coming out and we, we jump on it as soon as we can. Yeah. So in our first chat, you discussed averaging up and you really emphasized how much you love doing it. One of the examples that you used was Bowflex, which is now Nautilus, um, as an example that you should have been buying even more of, even as the price increased. So for some value investors listening, they might be horrified by the concept of increasing their cost basis on a stock. But I'm interested in getting a better understanding of when and why averaging makes sense for you. How do you get started with stock investing? I've put together a course to teach you everything I wish I knew when I first started investing in stocks. Let's start at the beginning and ask what is a stock? Let's zoom on in into what it's actually like to buy a stock. A few options are Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, Ally, E-Trade. Fortunately, you won't have to necessarily calculate all of these taxes yourself. I'll outline a few main ones to be aware of throughout your lifetime investing journey. As Warren Buffett says, your best investment is yourself. There's nothing that compares to it. By the end, you'll be savvier about stock investing and personal finance than the vast majority of people. Even if you're not a total beginner, I'm confident you'll get a lot out of the principles and strategies I outline, which we'll build on throughout. A link to the course is available in the description below. See you there. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, exactly. It's, it's um, I've got the experience of doing it the wrong way to, to, <laughs> to, to work from. Um, so really what you're trying to do is you're trying to always have an understanding of what you think the value of the business is, um, and trying to buy it below what that value is. Now, if it's a growing company, that value theoretically should continue to increase, um, you know, ideally along with the, the price, but sometimes the price doesn't properly match it. So, so what you're doing is you, you're, you're trying to, you know, make sure you still have that margin of safety, um, as that value is growing and that, that share price is either you know, growing with it or, or perhaps, you know, not growing fast enough to, to, to meet value. So, so we're constantly measuring that. Uh, like we don't blindly buy just because it's going higher, but if the value is increased significantly and we feel there's still that margin of safety, we're in there, continue to buy. Now, the, the thing to be careful too, is that like, we have to measure that against all the other opportunity costs that we have, right? So we're going to look at that opportunity. And if it, if it's looking 
fantastic and still better than anything else we can find, then that's the impetus to, to continue to add to that position. If it's growing and the share price is going up, but we're finding something that's better, then we're unlikely to add to that, that position. And so when you're, when you are averaging up, I assume you're, it's the same kind of thing. I guess you're just updating your peg ratios and, and if the, uh, you know, if the PE is, is low enough, but then the growth is still high enough, then that's kind of where your opportunity is. Yeah. I usually, when we get heavily involved in a, a company, we're, we're going to really understand it well enough. So some, some cases, you know, we've seen it recently with another company, um, you know, it, the, the allowance of contract, for example, and we'll be able to really understand quickly how much that contract is going to impact the value. And if we think the market hasn't properly responded to that, that's, that's going to drive us to be buyers again. So it doesn't necessarily have to be that their, their, you know, their growth rate every you know, quarter is showing up and it's higher and we're waiting for that. We'll see other, you know, potential value drivers that we're going to jump on. And, and a big part is because we understand the business so much. And we know that, look, if they land a $2 million contract, what kind of, what kind of impact should that have on value, right? That's what we do. We really get under the, the hood and understand what's driving it and, and, you know, buy when we think it makes sense. And what's the most you'll average up by cost basis in one position as a percentage of your entire portfolio? You know, it, 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 there's no set, like what I find that the best investors out there don't, don't have sort of preset parameters around that sort of stuff. What, what they do is they, they look at every case on a case by case basis, right? So if all of a sudden some company has, you know, doubled its value based on some, some material event, that shouldn't prevent you from dramatically increasing your, your percentage ownership. Now, especially if you have the confidence that that's the best opportunity for you out there, right? Again, the, the exercise that we go through of looking at so many companies gives us comfort that we're, you know, ideally buying the best four or five opportunities that we think we can get our hands on. And if there's a change in, you know, the value of that business, it shouldn't have, well, based on my experience, it shouldn't have that much of a difference in terms of what you decide to do with it in your portfolio. That, 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 what's it called? Recency bias or, or agency bias. No, that's not agency bias, but you know, because you own 5% of that company or 5% in your portfolio, if all of a sudden it's the, the most obvious opportunity for you, you have to go and increase your position in a material way. You can't sit there and say, no, I already own my 5%. I can't, I can't buy any more based on, on that rule. It's just like the best investors in the world don't do that. I mean, again, Warren Buffett, I mean, there's so many examples of him in, in that adage, you know, when it rains gold, you don't put out a thimble, you take out a wheelbarrow or a bucket or whatever you want. Yeah. So I know that you aren't a huge fan of uh, averaging down in the majority of circumstances. You wrote a really good analogy why that is. Quote, if you personally lent someone money and they only repaid you half of what they owed you, would you give that person more money? Of course not. Yet we continually do this with our investing where we average down into things that have a history of disappointing us, unquote. Since many of the businesses that you look at are often overlooked for extended periods of time, it would seem that averaging down can sometimes make sense if the business is increasing value at a quick rate, but the price has decreased. So I'd just love to have your thoughts on averaging down and when you think it is, it does make sense. Yeah, you're right. We, we, we rarely average down, right? Um, now we do try to get to know these companies as, as well as we can and there's really two distinctions, right? There's a value and then there's a price, right? So the value, we try to understand the value as much as we can, right? So if for some, you know, arbitrary reason, the price goes down, yet the value has not changed. You know, we see that from time to time for different reasons. You know, an institution has to sell or some investor has to sell. Maybe even an insider has to exercise options or sell for whatever personal reasons. When we see that, sometimes there's a negative sort of uh, sentiment towards the company. And we try to balance or, or understand, um, does it make sense? And if it doesn't, then that's a, that's a case where we might look at it a little bit differently and say, okay, yeah, the share price is down. Um, it does make sense to buy it here. The value hasn't changed. In some cases, the value has improved, and yet we're seeing downturn because of circumstances that are not reflect in the business. That's when we'll look at something like that. But if it's just down on price and we can't, substantiate, um, you know, the value, if, if like, if, if the value has gone down as well, along with the price, then quite frankly, we actually started looking at selling rather than looking at adding to our position. 
we can go and buy something else, right? That's always the driver. We're going to go and find something that just gives us more confidence and gives us what we're looking for. So as Charlie Munger once said, quote, I've always believed that nothing was worth an infinite price. So now we're, I'm looking more here at what, what you're going to do with something that you've already held that's gone up in price a lot. So my question for you is, at what point are you thinking it's time to sell a position based purely on evaluation decisions? So, I mean, we talked about the peg ratio before, right? So that's um, usually if, if, you know, when we look at a company in isolation, it becomes, uh, there's two reasons to sell. One is uh, the valuation actually has exceeded sort of that peg ratio, you know, that one, then, then it becomes, almost becomes an automatic sell. Or if the, the, the business itself is, is broken down. So let, let's say all of a sudden it stops growing, right? Um, or, or there's a material event that, uh, that we think is, is, de you know, destroying value or, or impeding value that, that automatically makes us a seller. But quite honestly, the, the sort of the biggest reason we tend to sell uh, something is because there's something else that's much more compelling, right? So yes, this stock maybe is trading at a 0.9 of peg ratio. It's not perfectly valued. It's, you know, it's gone up and we're happy and all that sort of stuff. But now we're finding another one that's trading at 0.2 times peg ratio. And, it, and, and it's less discovered in a whole host of things that we look for. Then it becomes uh, a, a situation where we could say, okay, we're going to start allocating capital from here and start moving it over here. So that, that tends to be the biggest driver of our sales. Um, again, it, it, it's, it's handy to be able to look at everything because it, it, everything in investing uh, is really a function of opportunity cost. And that's a big, big function of it right there. Absolutely. And so I'm just also interested. So obviously a lot of these companies that you might get, let's say using this example, you just use when it gets to a 0.9 peg ratio, it might still be doing really, really well. And you know, the fundamentals mm -hmm. might be going at, at, at a good place. So because of that, are you usually um, fully exiting positions? Like, you know, once it hits something and, and you have another use for the money, are you just fully exiting? Or do you usually like to leave a little bit in there to let it keep running? Or I'd love to know your ideas on that. Yeah. So it, it's, it's pretty rare that we fully exit. Um, like again, if something goes wrong, right? Yeah. We're, we're looking to fully exit as fast as we can, but if they're still, is still sort of executing, they're still creating value. Um, all the right things are still there and it's just a function of valuation. Then, um, it's less urgent to sell, right? We're, we're a little bit more patient. The, the thing you have to factor in too is the whole idea of taxes, right? Because if you're if you're going to turn over, then then you get tax consequences, and that that actually mitigates your, your gain. So, holding a good long term winner that that gives you confidence and you have conviction in, um, it pays to hold on a longer time there, even if it's fairly valued, right? So so that that those are all considerations that we have to to use, but we rarely sell our whole position when something goes wrong. Partly because, you know, if it's grown to a sizable amount, it may be very difficult to sell that and redeploy all that capital all at once anyway. So you're, you're better off sort of slowly selling off. And then look, I mean, it, it's, it's like, <laughs> it's like, I don't know if it's like the children or your wife or something like that. You, you, you don't never, you never want to give up on them. <laughs> like kind of, they've done the right thing. You don't necessarily want to give up on them. It's, uh, it, it's, it, it's. That conviction is important. You've come to understand that business. So therefore, the, the new opportunity has to be very, very compelling to be willing to give up all that, that sort of comfort and that need. So I'm interested in knowing more about your strategy when a business decreases in growth. So we talked about when it's, you know, it's, st it's still going good, but now let's look at when something decreases in growth. So let's go through a quick hypothetical. A business meets your stringent criteria for entry into your portfolio. It had a few good quarters of profitability growing well above 25% in you know, revenue and per share earnings. And you averaged up to, let's say, a, a high single digit percent of your portfolio by cost basis. But now growth is slowed. What needs to happen to get the alarm bells kind of ringing that are telling you to sell or to wait longer? Um, yeah, I'm just interested in knowing what you would do in that scenario. Yeah, so, so it depends on how how much it's changed, right? If it's gone from, you know, 60% growth to, to 30%, we may not, we may not sell it at all. It might, you know, might still justify owning it. If it's gone from say 50% down to 5%, then, you know, then, then it's a function of selling it when you can. Now, some of the, some of the issues around, you know, micro caps is that liquidity becomes a, a con, you know, 
a consideration. So if it's not very liquid, you're limited in terms of how fast you can sell at a reasonable price anyway. But let's assume you've got liquidity and you can sell. Um, again, the, the driver is going to be, what are you going to do with that cash, right? Um, is, is, there, is there still a margin of safety in owning it right now? Probably or probably not. And that, that, I, that's going to be the other thing that's going to decide. If, if the stock still looks real cheap, even though the, the, the growth rate has come down as much, then I'm not as anxious to sell. Uh, unless I've got that other opportunity. So, so much goes back to what can I do with, with the resulting cash and, and that, that'll determine how fast I'm going to sell this. Thing. So you mentioned recently that some of your legacy positions were causing a bit of a drag on returns in 2023, even though you had a few very high performing stocks in your portfolio. So I know exactly the pain of carrying legacy positions and uh, <laughs> what that can do for your overall results. So I'm interested in knowing what are some of the key insights from your experience in investing that help you best deal with legacy positions? If you decide to sell, um, you sell, right? I, I think everybody has that one stock or maybe a handful of stocks where you sit there and go, yeah, but you know, it still has that chance, right? <laughs> what if I just wait a little bit longer? Um, you know, experience should have taught me better that once, once you've sort of started the process, it's almost impossible to stop. And the best thing to do is, is to sell and act, use not, not just that the physical currency, but the mental currency, right? Um, th this, this business is so much about psychology and sort of mental applications that why, why have something that that's not working for you and is, is an eyesore and, you know, <laughs> makes you cry every time you think of it. Why have it in your portfolio? Get rid of it as fast as you can. Move on to something else. There's an old adage that uh, an old broker I used to work with uh, used to give me. Um, it's easier to give birth than it is to raise the dead, right? So if you've got a stock that is dead, get rid of it. You know, go find something else. Go give birth to some other opportunity. That, that, that's, that's my motto now. But still, you know, I, I, I've got to put it a lot more in practice than, than, I, than I have, you know? Yeah, in 2023, I really focused on that. And, and you know, I had a few, everyone has holdings that they, they just look at. And every time, you, every time you look at it, it just feels like it, the news is bad. You know, they're, they're just not doing what they're supposed to be doing or what you thought they were doing. And it, it's just like, it's like a mental drain and a strain just to own it. And then, so basically I had a few positions like that and I literally just got rid of them. And granted, you know, it, it, unfortunately I got rid of, I think all I got all three of them at a loss. Um, but you know, it's, it, it makes investing a lot more enjoyable, a lot more fun. And, you know, like you said, right. I mean, there's, there's always an opportunity out there. And, and, uh, a lot of times if, you know, if your businesses aren't performing well, you're better off just going and find a business that is performing well. Yeah. Well, I, you know, what, what, what you should always ask yourself is when you're holding that, that stock, ask yourself if you truly believe this is the best investment opportunity that you have access to, Right. And if the answer is no, well, the answer should, you know, the, the result should be, I'm going to sell it and go find that, that better opportunity, right? That's, that's what we do day in, day out is just constantly uh, assume that there's something better out there and, you know, we look for it. So I know you talk to many public businesses just on your day-to-day -day, uh, uh, life and for small cap discoveries um, and industry experts. Also, you talk to a lot um, and have tons of really good friends in the investing community. So I'm interested in knowing how you built up such a good network and how that network has improved your investing. Yeah, a great question. I, th I think, you know, like I've been at this now for about 30 plus years. So a lot of it is just, you know, accumulating uh, experiences, both good and bad. I, I mean, I think it's really vital, especially when you're in you know, investing in the micro cap space is to get to know the players, right? There's, um, it, it, I understand the system too, right? We talked about financing in the past and, and how important it is to understand how that works and who the players are and, and, you know, what can go wrong, what can't go wrong. Um, you know, accumulating a network of investors is really important because, you know, you can't expect to know everything. Um, you can't expect to know everyone, right? So a lot of times I'll phone up somebody who may know, you know, the, the management team over here or uh, in this other business. And, you know, all, all these little clues are things that are going to help build your conviction, build your understanding of the business. So it's important you reach out. It's important that you ask questions. And I think the other thing is, you know, I, I find that a lot of people, especially in the micro cap space, well, quite frankly, even in, you know, investing in general, there's a lot of people that are willing to give back and, and help 
you know, people who are starting out and answer questions and, you know, in some cases, mentor, you know, young people who are trying to build their network. Those things are really, really important. And you can fast track your learning by getting in front of as many people as you can and, and ask them, right? Yeah, sure. Some are going to say no, but get out there and, and, and talk to people, um, ask them, you know, ask them what their experiences were, or ask them for help. Um, you'd be shocked. Um, you know, 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 know what people's motivation is as well, right? Um, this is an industry that, you know, typically people get paid for either information, they get paid for, for doing things, it, you know, understand that help when you can understand that, you know, some are looking for, for payment for things and, and just get out there, get out, get out to conferences, ask questions, phone companies, you know, micro caps are, are, you know, the type of companies where if you pick up the phone and, and try to talk to the CEO, you're likely going to be able to talk to them. You're not going to be able to pick up the phone and talk to the CEO of Google, or, or I think your odds are pretty, pretty low. So um, get out there and start that. And then after a while, you'll, you'll find that, you know, your network uh, starts to actually work for you. Ideas will be shared, um, you know, different bits of information come back and forth. And then that's, that's what this business is all about. Yeah. One thing I've really noticed just honestly from doing this kind of same kind of things you, you, you say, which is, you know, asking other people for help and, um, you know, reaching out to people, asking questions and contributing to other people is that, uh, once you, once you start getting a network of people who really know you and like you and who've, who you've helped before people just share ideas with you. And, and, and it's awesome. Cause, cause these are people who, who know you, right. It's not like, you know, if I came up to you and were like, Oh, Hey, uh, Paul, I got this really good idea. It's called Apple. It's like, okay, well, <laughs> I know you well enough that you have zero interest in, in, in that idea. So you'll get people who know you and, and know your investing style and know the types of investments that you look at. And it, it's powerful and it, and it can, it can really help with efficiency too. Right. I mean, like, you know, if it, obviously you, I know you do all the work your own and, and you, you know, you're probably not relying on other people for too many ideas, but um, it helps when, when you have other people who can kind of steer you in the right directions with just saving time. Immense amount of time is saved by, by having the right people. And, and look, I mean, there's, it's impossible to know everything. So, uh, you know, real world examples, there's a, you know, a couple of companies that we've looked at in the, the life science space, so pharmaceutical space, and we know people in the industry now through, you know, our relationships in the past. And when we have a tough, uh, you know, sort of question or something we need to understand, we'll, we'll reach out and sure enough, they, they know what we're all about and they'll, they'll gladly help when they can. That's, that's the beauty of this sort of stuff is that uh, nobody in this, on this planet knows all the information and uh, you reach out and you have people that are willing to help. Exactly. So small caps have historically outperformed all other deciles of the market. And with how much of a run the Magnificent had in 2023, it seems that perhaps capital may once again flow to small caps, but who knows? Um, it does seem like it's taken a long time for micro caps to have their day in the sun. I'm interested in knowing what are you seeing in the market today that makes you bullish on small caps for the future? So um, the market is made up of all different stocks, right? So um, I'm a believer that value always does well, right? And when I say value, um, you know, mispricing. So if something is growing and it's not properly priced, that over time, that, that'll, that'll perform and do well. Um, I've seen sort of over the last two years, I'd almost call it two different markets, right? I, I, you can even say three different markets. The big stocks for sure and the indexes and the, the stocks that everybody knows, they've done exceedingly well. Um, then you get the rest of the market, right? And I'll call it the smaller companies. Within that, that sort of component, there's, there's, I break it into two different pieces. One is the profitable and growing smaller companies and then everybody else. So if, if you look at the small companies as a group, yes, that's performed quite poorly over the last two years, especially in, in comparison to the big guys. But if you look at the small and growing profitable companies, they've actually done really, really well, like really well. Um, so, you know, three different kinds of markets to look at. If, if, you're, if, you, if you look at the whole thing, you go, okay, well, that kind of looks okay. It doesn't look too bad. If you're just playing in these, these sort of money losing small companies, you're going, oh my God, it's been terrible for the last two, three years, right? But then if you're that other sandbox that, that I love to play in, you know, we've had a fantastic year last year. As a matter of fact, we've had two fantastic years when everybody else has been complaining about the, the small companies. So now going forward, what I think is interesting is that more and more people are starting to figure it out, 
right? We're, we're starting to see a little bit more sort of bigger capital come down market and they're starting to distinguish between those two sort of smaller markets. Um, the, the, the small companies that we look at that are profitable and growing, they're not as cheap as they used to be, right? So we're not finding as many, you know, no brainer opportunities as we did two years ago. So that means capital is coming in, but it's nowhere near the kind of capital that we've seen in prior sort of bull markets for small companies. So I think there's a tremendous upside for these small and growing uh, microcap companies because that institutional capital is just starting to trickle down market right now. And when it does, you get a really euphoric bull market. Now, the other market, that money losing market, now, you know, I know the industry. Institution, you know, institutional players and investment bankers need to eat, right? And they have to go and generate uh, uh, revenue for themselves. And the way they do that is through financings. So I do think you're going to start to see, you know, the last two years, there's been absolutely almost zero IPOs and financings, but you're going to start to see that research, in my opinion. So I think you're going to start to see the full smaller market is actually going to do significantly better than it's done the last two years. I think the, you know, profitable and growing companies are going to continue to do very well because of that capital coming down market. But I think some of that capital is going to go into that, you know, sort of the more speculative area as well. And I think that's going to buoy the whole market. I would, you know, if I were a hedge trader um, and I could hedge the big markets, I, I'd be selling the big markets and going long the small markets because I think there's a huge um, sort of historical uh, mispricing of those two assets right now. Historically, small stocks always traded at a premium to big stocks, and now we're seeing the opposite. So yeah, one, one thing you mentioned there that the last two years for you guys have been really, really good, even though you know the market, broadly speaking, for small caps hasn't been good. Um, so I looked at like you know the performance of some of your cheapies with a chance over the years, and it, it's it's pretty incredible how it just always seems to do really, really well. So it seems almost like, you know, it doesn't really even matter if, you know, you're not getting a huge influx of money into these small caps. It, it just seems like because the businesses that you're look at, looking at are really, really cheap, um, you know, you just need a couple of eyes on it and that can generate returns even in, 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 uh, even in the presence of a market that isn't necessarily conducive to success for them. Well, okay. So a couple of things that unwind, right? Um, Institutional investors, typically in Canada, they they look at companies, you know, at the early stage, usually about $50 million market cap, right? Um, you know, you really have to get to about $100 million market cap before the, the, the real institution money starts to play. So what you want is you want to find a company that maybe it's a $40 million, maybe $50 million market cap, whatever. But if it's growing um, and it continues to grow, sooner or later, it's going to get to that size and it's going to show up on the radar screens of these institutional players. So So that's the beauty is if you can find those companies that are doing the right thing sooner or later. It's just a function of time, right? Now, sometimes what happens is it's not a function of time. It's a function of the, the sentiment in the market and it improves. And all of a sudden these guys, instead of, you know, using $50 million as their, their cutoff point, they start coming down to 20 and $30 million. So they come to the market and they generate it. So it's, it's just a function of time. It can happen, you know, over, over a couple of years or it can happen very quickly if if the sentiment starts to change and like i said we're starting to see the sentiment change right now so we actually think we're going to get that that lift that has not really shown up over the last two three years other than just these companies were growing and so during times like this where you know um ideas are just a lot harder to come by i mean i i follow obviously a lot of the businesses that you follow and and you know the prices have gone up quite a lot in a lot of them and, and they don't look quite as attractive as they once did um, are you usually just kind of just staying in the positions that you have and letting them run and maybe you'll give them a little bit longer of a leash because there's less opportunities, like you, you said, with opportunity costs, because there's maybe less opportunities out there. Um, you know, you're just more likely to let them run and, and see what they're going to do for the next few quarters. Thankfully, I've, I've been around this business for a long time. And what I recognize is as much as they've gone up, they haven't gone up to what they typically trade at. So, you know, we, we, you know, we look at these businesses and yes, they've done well. In some cases, they've doubled or tripled in, in the span of the last year, but they're still not close to where their valuation should be in a normal market, right? So like when, the, the other thing I learned very early on in my career is that, especially in Canada, the institutional capital that's out there really drives the markets, right? It, it is, it's not the retail market, it's the institutional capital. And there's a massive amount of institutional capital out there. 
Um, now, when they really come to play, it has a dramatic effect on share price. So this stock that might have been trading at 10 times earnings that, you know, it doubles in price because it's, uh, you know, it's grown and, and you know, multiple is expanded to 20 times. You're sitting there going, my God, I've tripled my money. But then along comes an institution and, and sits there and says, oh boy, if this keeps doing this for five years, this thing is a 10 bagger from here. So now they actually go in and they price it even higher, right? So we have not really seen that take effect yet. So the, these stocks that even though we're not finding as many great opportunities, they're still good opportunities. When that institutional capital comes down, you're going to see another, we, we call it a, a, another discovery uh, point in the discovery cycle. And that institutional discovery cycle is the most um, impactful and the, the fastest driver of change in share price that you can imagine. So yes, we sort of complain that we're not seeing as many good opportunities. But the opportunities we have, we're still highly convicted that that institutional capital, when it comes down, it's going to have a material impact on share price. And that, it, that institutional discovery process that, we, that you just discussed, um, is there like a general duration that that lasts for? Or is it just co basically completely dependent on you know, market forces and there's too many variables to think about? So... Um, there's there's a number of things that impact it, right? So we we've had a rough market in Canada and a rough market for small caps in Canada in general. So a lot of there's not been a lot of capital going into these institutional small cap investors, right? So they're they're kind of playing with a, a certain amount of cash. Now there are there there are issues around what they can and can't do in this environment. If a small company is not liquid enough for for these institutions to buy them, they can't buy them, right? Now you get a bull market. You get two things happening. There's more capital that goes into their, their portfolios and more of these companies become liquid. So you get those two effects starting to impact and all of a sudden they're playing ball, right? So that is that is yet to happen. That's what I'm talking about. When those two things happen, you have this bloated amount of cash that has to squeeze into a small supply of companies because that's all there is. There's just not enough. There was a time when we did a little bit of a study and there were more small cap funds in Canada then there were companies that they're qualified to buy, right? So you have this weird dynamic that as soon as a company hit a certain inflection point and was doing the right things, you had like 20 of these funds would jump in all at once. And of course, that would drive the share price like crazy. I think we're about to see that again. Paul, thank you so much for coming on to the show today. Where can the audience learn more about you and small cap discoveries? Well, first off, Kyle, thank you. It, it's always fun to talk to you. I love this stuff. Uh, you can see I can talk for hours and hours. Uh, but anybody interested, they can find, uh, well, they can find our service at smallcapdiscoveries.com. Um, if anybody's interested, uh, you know, we'll give them a free trial if, they're, if they mention uh, you and, and your service. Um, also, you can find me on Twitter. I'm crazy Twitter poster. So I'm, I'm there at Paul Andriola. And uh, yeah, and you know, if they reach out and they've got any questions regarding anything around this sort of stuff that we talked about, I'm happy to, happy to answer and help how I can. I think when most investors think about multi-baggers, they think of companies like Google or Apple or NVIDIA or Netflix or Meta. Yes, those companies are multi-baggers, but a majority of the multi-baggers that occur in the public marketplaces don't look like NVIDIA and Apple. They look like businesses, they're a five or $10 million revenue business that's slightly profitable that they can turn into a 30 or $40 million business and make more money. They're these small companies that can just grow revenues, grow earnings, and not dilute. 